All right, last session of the day. Awesome. Talk about pressure. No pressure. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. You heard it this morning with Bob Chapman's opening keynote, but I want you to imagine that it is not just Barry Waymuller. Imagine that we all work at and support workplaces where people can be truly human, where they can show up as their best selves every day. They can admit when they screw up. They can feel supported to learn, stretch, and grow. They can have meaningful and purposeful work when we're, they're there. And they go home and they still have something left and they can be fully present with their loved ones. We not only hope and wish that this is possible, we know it's possible. Many of you here, your organizations as you're presenting today are examples of that. And we also know that every single one of you in this role, every single one of us in this room, plays a role in making that a reality, in leaving here and inspiring positive change when we go home. But in order to do that, we have to rethink how we've done some things. We have to rethink some outdated, mechanistic, dehumanized approaches, and specifically this afternoon, rethinking really what it means to be healthy and well, and how that actually plays in to having humanized organizations where this vision is a reality and not just a pipe dream for a few. And we seem to forget this whole concept of being human and we treat people and we treat organizations as if they were dehumanized machines, as if they're predictable, as if they're controllable, as if they don't have thoughts and feelings and that doesn't matter and they can just keep going. I wanna give you a real life example of this. My experience of being in an organization that was very much humanized and what happened when it didn't tend to that, when it didn't nurture that, and it became dehumanized. Several years ago, I worked for an organization and I had meaningful and purposeful work. You would have called me an engaged employee. I had happy clients, I got along with my coworkers, I was growing my area in revenue, all the things that you would normally consider to be successful. And I loved it there. But what was more important to me than anything is I found out just how human they were. When life does what it does and throws curveballs at you and you still have to pick yourself back up and keep going, I found out how human they were. What do I mean by that? I want you to meet my son, Peyton. This is him when he was about eight months old. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and this is when our lives changed. I want you to imagine this lovely, smiling, happy baby suddenly collapsing and going lifeless in your arms. I want you to imagine a household where my husband and I are every 30 days dealing with this and not knowing what's wrong with him. We're taking turns laying him in between us in our bed and we're watching him breathe and taking turns not sleeping, not knowing if he was gonna die in the middle of the night. Imagine this happening every 30 days, five days at a time, and you're trying to get work done and you're going in the hole in paid time off and we would look at each other and say, this is how people lose their jobs. Meanwhile, all we're worried about is, is our son gonna live? Well, my human organization put their arms around me and loved me and said, you know what, every time this happened, I would get a phone call from my leader saying, how are you doing? Do you need anything? Don't worry about stuff. And because I had that support, you know what, I still managed to grow our area in revenue. People were still happy. We're in and out of specialists trying to figure out what was going on. But unfortunately, that didn't last. And we became completely dehumanized, and I went literally from being pretty much my leader's golden child to being shit on the bottom of his shoe. They joined a larger organization. They went from being people are unique, people get to step up and be leaders, to you need to go into a box. You need to do what we say. You need to stop challenging the status quo, which try telling me that and that doesn't work so well. And didn't care that Peyton was going through stuff. So we're still dealing with all that. Now add on the stress of trying to deal with what we were dealing with. And the cherry on top of dehumanization. This is about a couple years later, three years old. This is the last picture of Peyton with my dear Uncle Buford. My mom's family's from the South, there you go. 
And he had an aggressive form of brain cancer, and this was the last time we saw him. And when Buford died, I didn't so much as get sorry for your loss that you would say to a complete stranger. I got a, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And literally got written up for not participating in daily and stretching programs. This is what happens when an organization doesn't care and stops realizing what it means to be human. And it can happen whether there's a merger or acquisition, it can happen with growth and you don't pay attention to it, it has a human toll. Now I am very happy to report that when Peyton turned five, we got answers and he had surgery, a very simple surgery and has been healthy ever since. And two weeks ago, happily celebrated his eighth birthday and in fact, he's sitting over there handsome in his suit. <laughs> I love it. So, with that, what does the research tell us about what happens when organizations become dehumanized? Well, you heard some of this this morning with Bob Chapman. We know that our engagement rates haven't changed much in 30 years, right? Nearly 70% of the workforce is disengaged, and we're stressed, and we know it's a main source of stress. We know that from research that looks at employee engagement, that guess what, as employee engagement drops, we see an association with increased cholesterol, increased glucose, increased triglyceride levels. We see nearly twice the onset of new diagnoses of depression and anxiety when people are not engaged versus being engaged. We know that disengaged employees have 62% more workplace accidents than engaged employees. Right? We know this matters. But we also know that well-being matters. We know that you can work and you can be engaged and you can be pushing yourself, but if it's to the detriment of your own well-being, that's not good either. And what we know when people are engaged and they're thriving in their well-being, both of those things, you have exponential benefits. Our world is constantly changing, disruption's a new norm, and guess what? When you're both engaged and thriving, you're going to be able to adapt to it. You're going to be able to recover from injury. You're not going to be looking for that next job. It matters profoundly, but we have to look at it differently. And we know that when it's not there, it's not just my experience. If you look at the research, you heard Bob talk about Monday morning heart attacks this morning. We know that when we have poor leaders, it sucks the well-being out of us. We see all kinds of consequences, but we know that when we have servant leadership and we have humanized workplaces, it actually boosts and enhances well-being. There's a business reason why we should care about both. And we know that those negative job conditions impact various well-being or healthy behaviors. We know that people tend to turn more to drinking and smoking and drug abuse and look at some of the opioid epidemic and overeating. It makes sense. If you are going to a place where you feel like crap, you want relief. You want to feel better as quickly as you can, so you turn to different behaviors to try to alleviate that discomfort. And you saw this from Bob Chapman this morning. Guess what? Not only do toxic workplaces cause up to 120,000 excess deaths per year, this makes workplaces the fifth leading cause of death in this country. Workplaces are the fifth leading cause of death. And they contribute to 8% of our healthcare spend. Think about that for a second. That's huge. And so if we want to talk about our healthcare crisis, we have to also start talking about how the workplace is contributing to this. We are living in a world where disruption is the norm. There's a term called VUCA that some of you might be familiar with that has been widely used in the military for decades, and it's been now more widely adopted in the human resources world and the business world. It describes the realities of the world we live in. It's volatile. It is uncertain. It is complex, and it is ambiguous. We are in a world where disruption is the norm and we need to equip people to be able to cope with it in a competent way, the def better definition of health. How do we help people cope in a world where disruption is the norm? And we know from research that Deloitte does every year on over 10,000 leaders worldwide, they start to look at the trends. And in 2017, they said we have got to start embracing new ways of thinking. We cannot keep looking at things through this old paradigm lens. We have to rethink how we go about stuff. We've got to stretch ourselves. We've got to go about it differently. And they took it a step further in 2018, saying that, you know what, we now know 
that people are judging businesses based on their impact in the world, their social responsibility. That's why it's so important to learn about how we do this in conscious capitalism, and, and you're gonna hear more from Raj tomorrow and Friday. And we know that our workforce is changing. We know the millennials are now probably the most studied generation in history, but you also start to look at Gen Z, and guess what? This new future majority, which is already here, they want meaning and purpose. They want to be human. They want to be able to screw up and learn from it. They want to grow. But they also have a keen radar for bullshit. They're not gonna put up with it and they're not gonna wait for you to figure out your dysfunction. They're gonna go somewhere that doesn't have that dysfunction. There's not the patience anymore to sit around and figure it out. We've got to move this forward and we've got to figure it out. And as the late, great Peter Drucker says, we cannot, in this times of VUCA world, we cannot act with yesterday's logic. We cannot keep using outdated definitions of health. We cannot keep treating people like machines. We need to start leading into the future because we know that the future of great workplaces really lies in people fusing their personal and professional lives, to bring their best selves to work, so they can be both engaged and thriving in their well-being. This is the future. And so we created this visual called the Thriving Organization Pyramid to try to help explain this as we're talking to organizations, and it's become a great conversation tool that can be helpful to think about this. And you think about this idea of fusion, if you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you don't have the base, food, water, shelter, where you were born, then you can't be self-actualized at the top of the pyramid. And so I just want to go through this briefly to give you a sense of how you can look at your organization and where you are. If you look at the base, it's that humanistic culture. It's that the underlying attitudes, values, and perceptions are one where people are valued as a human being. They are cared about. It matters. Because we know that culture trumps everything else. And that's not the perks and the things you have, that's climate, the actual underlying values and attitudes. And we know from the great work of Brene Brown, and I know there's sessions here as well, it's not just about physical safety, that is also important. But you have a psychologically safe workplace. Can people feel okay to say, I need help? Can they feel okay to screw up? Can they feel comfortable to stretch and grow? That's got to be at the base. If that's not there, you can't get a lot further. You want health, you want people to be able to comp cope in a competent way. We have to have a humanistic culture at the base. And then just right with that is quality leadership because we know that every interaction anybody has with any leader within your organization reinforces his or her belief about the culture. But who is a leader? Everyone, yes. I love this definition from Daniel Harlan. Leadership at its core is about being the best version of yourself so that you can maximize your positive impact on the world. That's what being a leader is. It is a behavior. And for those people who actually have people leadership responsibilities, it's about unlearning management, which you heard this morning from Bob, and relearning what it means to be human. Every single one of us in this room has the opportunity to be a leader, to step up, to influence positive change. That is our opportunity. You don't have to have a title or a role. In fact, you probably know many people who have that, and they're that boss, they're that manager, they are not a leader. And then you get into the middle, where we start to fuse a little bit more, where we start to see the interconnection even more of individual well-being and health factors and organizational well-being factors. And there's a lot of sessions here at this conference all about this. Purpose over profit and having good communication. I've been to great sessions today about this already. And how do we build trust and connection and support? Because as human beings, we want to be in relationship with people. And we want to be the authors of our own destiny. And we know that it's not about the perks and it's not about all that fluff. It's not about those cute amenities. That's not what matters, and that's not what's going to attract and retain people, and that's not what's going to help you moving forward. It's do people feel cared about as human beings? Are they engaged in their work? Does the work environment foster that? Can you be both engaged and thriving in your well-being? Are you supported and coping in a competent way? And so then you get to the top of the pyramid, which is 
having programs and resources that support you in all areas of well-being, psychological and physical and career and financial, but treating you as a human being who can think for yourself, not as a machine who needs to be controlled. And so now what? What, what do you do with all of this? We say this all the time, but building human workplaces, building thriving workplaces, is not, never has been, and cannot be a solo journey. This is about building relationships. And so use the networking cards here, the conversations on the back of your name tag, build relationships here and when you go home. If you don't normally collaborate with people in training and development or wellness or safety or finance or wherever, start building relationships. Be the leader to influence change and say, what would it be like if we could all come to work and love being here and could still go home the best versions of ourselves? What would that look like? And let's start to paint that future and co-create it. You do it in relationship. You don't do it by yourself. And if you look at the pyramid as a guide, just take a pulse of where your organization is as you're having these conversations with people. Is your base strong and solid? Awesome. Keep fostering that and nurturing that so you don't go backwards like the experience I had. You don't go from being humanized to dehumanized. You have to nurture it. And then start to move up the pyramid and go, well, where are there opportunities to strengthen? Where are there gaps? And move up to the top. But if you're sitting here going, I am trying to insert employee engagement programs, recognition programs, wellness and well-being programs, safety and risk management, fill in the blank and you wonder why you're struggling and you wonder why it's hard and why people don't care and ending up incenting people and doing all these dehumanized approaches, my guess is that you've got an opportunity at the base of your pyramid and you want to have well-being, you want to have wellness, you want to have health, you've got to have that solid base. And you do that by building relationships and starting to advocate for humanity. And finally, this is why we have a track here at this conference about becoming the best version of yourself. We have to move past our own self-limiting dialogue. How many times do you hear yourself say things like, well, I'm just a fill in the blank. I'm just a so-and-so. I'm not a manager. I'm just a human resource person. I'm just a wellness person. I don't have access to the C-suite. The list goes on and on and on. Stop. We have been seeing firsthand, you can affect change on the one-on-one -on -one level and you can affect change at the team level and start to build a critical mass within an organization. And it just takes one person being willing to step up as that leader. Stop limiting yourself and saying, I'm just a whatever. You're a leader, you're a human. You're building relationships in a network and we're gonna be supporting you after this conference with conference learning summary and post-conference email tips and building community here so you can go back and put your cape on and start to put humanity back at the forefront. We've got to stop limiting ourselves by our roles and our definitions and start really stepping in to our greatness. Thank you. Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs>